Um, so hi, uh, my name is Stefan Lawig, and I'm here from Microsoft uh, to tell you about uh, some features in Visual Studio 2010, which just released a month ago. Um, we have this uh, feature um, that allows you to interpret complicated data structures, such as those in the STL and Boost, um, and display them in a much more convenient format uh, in the IDE. Um, and this uh, machinery is actually somewhat extensible. Uh, so you're actually able to write your own visualizers for boost types or your own types um, and stick them in so that they're automatically uh, picked up by the IDE and you can have a lot easier time uh, debugging. Uh, so let's get started. Uh, so I am going to, except for one very simple example, of using uh, uh, data structures from the STL um, because their uh, source is known to me and uh, we already have visualizers for all of them. Um, so let's start off with my favorite data structure, Vector. Um, oh, and if you have any questions, uh, you're confused about a slide, feel free to stop me, um, uh, get clarification. If you have a question in the form, oh, can you do X, Y, or Z, or something about the compiler, but not about uh, the visualizers, uh, probably holding them t uh, to the end would be best. Uh, so, Vector, um, you know, we think of it as a, a simple data structure. It's used in all of our programs. Um, when we use a vector, what do we conceptually uh, model it as? Well, it's a flexible array of elements. Um, so, if I've got a vector of int that contains four ints, it's got, you know, 11, 22, 33, 44. And as I push back more ints, or, you know, range insert, or pop back, uh, this will grow and shrink. Uh, but, of course, um, this uh, chunk of elements is uh, allocated on the heap. Uh, the vector itself maintains a pointer um, to this chunk of elements. This is why vectors can be swapped, uh, no fail, constant time, non-iterator, validating. Um, and of course, the uh, vector needs to know its own size because that size is changing as you push back more elements. So it needs a size field. Um, in this case, I've got four elements. Um, and also, um, uh, new programmers aren't aware of this, but as you use vector more and more, um, you become aware that it's actually exponentially reallocating. It has a capacity and every time it runs out of capacity, it allocates a constant uh, factor more, like 1.5 in VC's implementation, or 2 in GCC's libs, uh, libs to C++. So in this case, I'm showing a vector that has a capacity of six elements, and I've got slack space at the end uh, for two more ints. Um, so if I push back 55 and 66, I won't reallocate. But as soon as I try to push back 77, I'm out of capacity. I'll need to allocate a whole new memory block. So this is what we conceptually model vector as, and this model is complete enough for us to reason about things like iterator and validation, the complexity of swap, and so forth. Um, but that's not actually how a vector is represented. And as soon as we start debugging things, um, we need to actually know about vector's representation. So vector does indeed store a pointer, but its pointer is not so nicely named. Um, in our implementation, um, our uh, pointer is actually named my first. Uh, so it's a Dinkumware naming convention. Our library is licensed for Dinkumware, um, where data members usually start with my. Of course, it's, it's uglified, starting with underscore capital, so that user macros can't stomp on our identifiers, and vice versa. That works well until someone actually uses one of these, and then we stomp on them, and we get what they deserve. Uh, <laughs> I love stomping on programs that are doing something non-conformant. And so, this is somewhat unusual, but at least it says first. Now, it gets more complicated when it comes to the size. We don't actually store a size field of type size t. Instead, we store a pointer called my last that points one beyond the last actual element in the vector. This is convenient because when we're returning iterators, which are just wrapped pointers, um, if you ask for begin, we give you a wrapped my first, and you ask for end, you get a wrapped my last. Only if you ask for size do we have to subtract the pointers and do point arithmetic. But if you're just iterating through, this is actually more efficient and more natural for the operations that we're internally doing. Um, and similarly, our capacity is stored as another pointer to one past the whole block of elements, and we call this my end. Um, so if you want to know the size of a vector and you're looking at the debugger, you have to subtract a pointer. Same with the capacity. Um, the names are ugly, um, and also the names are somewhat confusing, because if you ask for begin and end, you get wrapped my first and my last. My end is something else entirely. You know, maybe that's a poor choice of names, but no one has to see those names unless you're debugging it or maintaining it. So what does Vector look like in the uh, debugger? Here I've got Visual Studio 2010. I'm saying that data structure rep representations are ugly because they're doing complicated things. So I here have constructed a vector that exactly models the previous slide with a capacity of 6. I did that by pushing back a 55 and then popping it. 
And if I start looking at the vector in the debugger, um, here I can see the field that I'm looking at, its value, and its type. Um, I see that the vector has a base class that I didn't tell you about. That base class has another base class for debugging information. You don't want to see any of that. Um, here I can see the my first, my last, and my end pointers um, that point to their elements. My last points to an integer that was actually popped. So this is technically garbage. Um, my end actually points to a debug fill pattern because it's pointing to a completely unallocated memory. Um, can, can everyone see this rather small text here? Hopefully. Okay. Um, and it's got an allocator member. We're not really interested in that. Um, now, all the information I want is here as long as I know the vector's representation is, and as long as I'm willing to put lots of uh, expressions in the watch window. So I can type v my last minus v my first to get the size, which is 4, same for the capacity. And I can say v dot my first bracket one bracket to get the one element, uh, which is 22. Uh, but this is rather inconvenient. I don't get to just see it all at once. So what visualizers do, these were originally implemented in Visual Studio 2005 um, and then enhanced in 2010 is they take STL containers and also iterators and other objects and they uh, format them in a much easier to read and understand manner. Uh, so my vector v, um, it is displayed as having a value and it says immediately that it has four elements, that's the size, and then the elements are 11, 22, 33, 44, and then if I pop it open, I can see that its size is four, its capacity is six, and its elements are here and they have these um, indices displayed on the left. So if I want to know what the third element is, well, it's 44. Um, this is convenient uh, even if I don't uh, pop open this list because I can see at least the size and the elements um, all at once in the value field. Um, this is especially important when working with things like vectors of vectors uh, or pointers to vectors, that sort of thing. Um, so another comparison, uh, shared pointer. Here I've got a shared pointer with uh, six other copies and three weak pointers pointing to it. If I look at it uh, in the debugger, I see again a base class. I see a couple raw pointers. I can eventually find the thing that it owns, this int 1729, and if I pop open its rep, um, I can see that it has uh, seven uh, uses in four weeks. This is also somewhat confusing because I only have three weak pointers here. This is due to an implementation detail of how we're keeping track of how many people own the ref count. Whereas if we use a visualizer, uh, we can format all this information at once, um, saying what the shared pointer points to, how many strong and weak refs it has, and some other information. Um, I'll be going over a shared pointer at the end of the presentation because this involves uh, the most high-powered feature uh, that we have in 2010. So, uh, any questions before we move on? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, I noticed that in the shared pointer one, you have yes. your deleter and allocator just says default. Yes, and that is the new feature I will be talking about. Okay, let's yes. back up one more slide. Okay. Uh, vector. Standard vector int standard allocator int. Yes. It would be, it would be slicker than wet ice if that was just standard vector int in the case Wouldn't of Wouldn't it be standard. nice if the debugger uh, was able to recognize default template parameters and put them in there? Unfortunately, it does not yet. Okay. Um, <laughs> the next time I talk to someone from the debugger team, I'll have to complain about that. So um, this also appears in our compiler error messages. So yeah. it appears in PDBs. It's everywhere. Right. And yeah. But it is obnoxious when you're working with things that you just don't care about, uh, like default comparators as well. <laughs> or, or you know, standard basic care traits. Yeah, care right. traits. Bob, 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 Bob. Oh, yeah, it's really bad. Transmission line noise. So, yeah. yeah. Anyway, Admittedly. I just noticed that in one case you, you had actually snipped out all the you, the uninteresting stuff, and in the other case it was still there. That's, uh, that's why I... Not in the type field. The type field is not actually under my control. Okay. Yeah, this always has the ugliness. <laughs> it's only the name of the value field that's under my control. Okay. There I can make it pretty. Um, and so it maybe, maybe half pretty. <laughs> Partially extremely ugly. Uh, did you have a question? You mentioned the uh, watch statements. Uh, uh, yes. So, okay. Sure. Um, what about the conditions on uh, breakpoints? Can I use the information that's in the visualizer? Um, the those data breakpoints, they really need to know about the exact names of fields. So if you wanted to break them by the vector size change, you would actually need to type in, um, you know, when v my last uh, changes. So there is a way to turn well, off the visualizer. data breakpoints. No, I'm sorry. Conditional breakpoints. No, I understand about data breakpoints. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, conditional breakpoints is when an expression changes? Right. It's been a while since I used them. Uh, oh, it's when I have a breakpoint mm -hmm. and I want to say break when um, so -and -so the capacity expression. is greater than 10. Or yes. Or uh, okay. the size change. Yeah, okay. Uh, that, uh, they're pretty similar. Um, yes, you would need to, if you wanted to break when the capacity changed, you would need to uh, look at you know my end. So the, 
Visualizer is only for printing the data in a nice manner, but they don't modify the rest of the debugger. Yeah, it's, it's purely a view that's applied on time. So there is a way to track the visualizers of the one that Yeah, well, <laughs> I'll, yes, so, some people notice it. Um, so gets, getting started. Um, uh, so the visualizers have two parts. What I refer to as the underlying visualizer machinery. Um, this is the stuff in the IDE that is actually capable of looking at the data structures in memory, um, filling up uh, the watch window or the locals window. Um, that uh, we don't have direct access to. Um, instead, uh, visualizers are driven by a text file. Um, this text file is called autox.dat, and it's written in a custom uh, sort of fragile language. Um, that describes how to interpret data structures and is parsed by the underlying visualizer machinery. Um, so my job, uh, Microsoft, is to maintain the C++ standard library. Uh, we license it from DataMware, but we have plenty of bugs that are coming in that I need to look at. Um, I actually write very little code myself. Um, I fix bugs, um, but code that I write from scratch, not so much. Uh, one of the things I do uh, write from scratch uh, is the visualizers in autox.dat. I wrote all the ones for tier one objects, and for C++ OX objects like forward list and unique pointer. Um, and I've been maintaining the existing ones like vector and deck and so forth. Um, so when you read autox.dat, you'll see a lot of comments in there. Uh, most of the detailed ones are mine. I've been trying to add more comments as I work on stuff uh, so that people who are trying to understand what I did will have an easier time. The original autox.dat from 2005 and 2008 RTM was rather sparsely commented, which is not so helpful if you're trying to extend it. Um, so they live in your Visual Studio installation. I've put the full path here, assuming you've installed it to the default location and you happen to be running x64. It's pretty easy to find, but it's in several subdirectories. Um, so this is the file uh, that has all of the existing visualizers, not only for STL types, but also for things like our concurrency runtime. Those are at the bottom of the file. <coughs> I mean, some other stuff for COM that I never look at. Um, so the important thing to remember about visualizers is that they are undocumented and unsupported. Undocumented means if you go to MSDN, you will not find any mention of them. <laughs> unsupported means that if you run into a bug, you're out of luck. If I run into a bug, I can complain to the debugger team and say, hey, you broke so-and-so, or I'm trying to do X, Y, Z, could you make that work? And they'll support me, um, but not general users, which is, it, you know, it's problematic because the machinery is really <laughs> targeted towards just displaying STL objects. So as long as you try to visualize things that resemble STL objects and you use the same sort of expressions, you'll find that the visualizers work very well. When you try to do completely new things um, with data structures that are radically different from the STL, uh, you will probably find bugs. Um, often you can uh, make the autox.dat parser simply choke. It'll display a little dialog saying, I couldn't parse this file. Um, or uh, you can simply straight up crash the IDE for bonus points. Um, <laughs> that's pretty awesome. So the traditional method to add your own visualizers is to hack autox.dat directly. Um, it has a comment, uh, do not modify, which you can simply ignore. Um, <laughs> however, I, I thought it was nice then to simply say, you know, we, we understand people want to modify this, but don't. Just ignore it. Um, so traditionally, um, you would want to definitely preserve an old copy of this in case you mess up, or in case you need to patch Visual Studio. I don't actually know what happens when you hack autox.dat and you try to apply a service pack that will modify the file, I would suggest at least restoring it before patching. Um, and the cute thing is that you can actually edit autox.dat within VS itself, because it's a text editor. Uh, if you're running on Vista or Win7, um, you will probably need to bypass uh, UAC. You'll need to right-click Visual Studio, run as administrator, because this thing lives in program files, and you're not supposed to be hacking that directly. But hey, turn off all the safeguards, start hacking away. Now, that was the traditional method, and until a couple of weeks ago, um, this was the only method that I knew, or that anyone else outside of the debugger team or a couple of guys in office knew. Um, <laughs> then a couple of guys in office told me, hey, there's another way to add your own visualizers. And I was, what? Uh, and it turned out that there actually is an even more secret, even more undocumented way to add your own <laughs> visualizers. And that's actually significantly better than the traditional method. So the super secret method is to provide your own file. Um, you simply have a text file. Um, and you set its location in a special environment variable, VCEE, that's the VCE expression engine, um, auto X, which stands for auto expand. Um, so if you just set that to, you know, C, foobar, blah, uh, visualizer.txt, um, and as long as that file begins with bracket visualizer bracket, um, then this will be uh, concatenated at runtime with the official autox.dat. So you put all your visualizers here and you never have to modify 
um, the central file. This could be extremely valuable. For example, boost 144.0 it comes with a boost.viz.txt or something um, that you simply tell users, hey, set this environment variable, and it'll be added to uh, the visualizers. Um, and this is a lot less dangerous because you won't mess up patching or anything. Um, actually, a lot more convenient. I wish I knew about it several years ago. Um, so the nice thing is that you don't always have to restart the IDE in order to uh, pick up changes. Um, if you simply stop debugging and then start debugging again with F5, um, this file and your optional extra file uh, will be parsed every time you start debugging. So you can change the visualizers, restart debugging without restarting the whole IDE, and they'll be picked up. Um, if you manage to make the parser fall over, you'll get a dialog saying, OK, I need to go fix my visualizers, try again. Of course, if you crash the IDE, you've got to restart the whole thing. Um, and also, uh, you're very observant. If you want to, if you have an object that's ordinarily visualized, but you want to turn it off just for a moment, um, if in the watch window, you type the variable's name and then comma exclamation mark or comma bang, that will disable visualization recursively. So not only for that object itself, but for any nested objects or things that it points to, everything will be turned off and you'll be able to look at the raw information as if no visualizers were there. It's also possible um, to have a visualizer, have an extra field that says like raw members. So if people are constantly wanting to look at the underlying members, uh, they don't have to say comma bang, they can simply pop open. Um, field. So, comma thing is the syntax for that. Uh, yeah, question. question. Does this also work in 2008? Yes, it works in all of 2005, 2008, and 2010. <coughs> it was added in 2005. I, it's not in uh, 2003. There was a much more limited functionality in 2003. Fortunately, no one should be using that IDE anymore. And, and it only accepts one, one file location? You um, can't use a list? No, this, I believe, was in 2000. Oh, uh, only one, yes. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't believe you can uh, semicolon separate it. As soon as someone mentioned this variable, I immediately started looking at the bug sources, right. and I saw I was loading just a single string and reading that file. Um, so if you're visualizing multiple libraries, you would need to concatenate all of those visualizers and stick them in a file, but at least you don't have to hack the centralized thing and yeah. potentially damage it. You could add that to your build script. Yeah, you could, or um, not, not only can you just set it to your, uh, set the environment variable in you know, Windows-wide or user-wide, it's also possible to set it in a, a batch file or something that the, then goes and spawns devm. As long as the environment variable is set when you spawn the IDE, it will be set for the lifetime of that IDE. So if you have like batch file that launches um, the you know, Visual Studio IDE, you could have that batch file also set the environment variable before it goes and spawns devm. So you potentially have several batch files loading different visualizers if you're working on completely different libraries. Um, some of our teams within Microsoft, like the uh, compiler backend team, um, have their own sets of visualizers for their own internal types. And mm -hmm. it, it's actually quite useful. So uh, in the future, I'd like to see Boost uh, doing some of this. Uh, OK, so I'm going to uh, constantly be referring to two terms. Uh, when you have a variable, in this case, the vector v, um, it has a value that's being generated by the visualizer, and I refer to this as the single line preview. Um, so we have control over what goes in the value. Um, we don't have control over anything in the type field. This is just automatically generated. Um, and below that, if you pop open this plus sign, you get a list of names paired with values, and I call these the children. Um, so every child, you can generate a name. In this case, I have a child with the fake name of bracket size bracket, and then a value. And we have control over both of these. You can also have automatically generated names for children like these array elements. OK, so let's start off trying to visualize a type. Um, here is my one type that doesn't come from the STL. Initially, I wanted to use um, std complex. Then I realized that it actually is with floats and doubles, and I didn't want a floating point sitting in here. So instead, I'm using a Gaussian integer, which is a, a complex number that has integer parts. So I've just got a very simple link space math struck Gaussian integer into A and B and I initialize uh, 1 to 3 and 4. So by default, if I look at it in the debugger, uh, structs are visualized with their elements, uh, and this is the default visualization that you get without doing anything special. So I see A equals 3, B equals 4, I can pop it open and see 3 and 4. But I think of you know, Gaussian integers as you know, x plus y times i. So what I would like to see is g uh, displayed as 3 plus 4i, and its fields, I would just like to add a little information saying that A is the real part and B is the imaginary part. Now, probably I should have named A and B better, but maybe they have names like RE and IM, and I would like to provide a more descriptive name um, in the visualizer because it doesn't hurt. So um, if I want uh, to write a visualizer for this, here I was using the old method of directly hacking autox.dat. Um, 
The syntax for this, you have to mention the true name of the type that you're visualizing, namespaces and everything, um, because essentially uh, the, uh, the underlying visualizer machine is looking at the type information from your PDB and doing basic string matching um, against it. So you have to qualify it with namespaces, um, and just like uh, partial specializations and that sort of thing, if you have like using directives, you can't use any of those. You need to talk about the true name that the uh, class lives in. So this is math, gauss, and integer. Um, I have control over both the single line preview and the children. Um, for the preview, I can have a list of expressions, and these will all be concatenated, glommed into a single string, which is then displayed as the preview. Um, so the syntax for that is preview, parenthesis, parenthesis. If I want a list of things, um, that's pound paren and then expressions inside. Uh, question? The type column lists the true name, right? So you can just, if you want to find out what it is. Exactly. Just, just look at that and basically <laughs> copy it. Yeah. So perhaps, you know, boost shared pointer is actually boost detail shared pointer. That would be the type you would need to put uh, in here. Um, so for my uh, preview, if I want to access the A field of my Gaussian integer, I need to say $E dot $A. $E means expression, the current thing being visualized. And then I can access any field in it as if I were typing it into the watch window. Um, and then I can say comma, put a string literal here, space plus space. I have complete control over spacing and everything. Um, and then the B field, and then tack on an I, and this is all concatenated um, by the underlying machinery. Um, with the children, I can again have a list with pound paren, um, and each child um, has a name and associated value. So the name of the first child, um, these are tied together with another pound paren, is A bracket, real bracket, then the name is separated by a colon, and then you have the field to display, and here it's just the A field. Um, same with the imaginary. Um, you'll notice that the syntax uh, for the name is a little more permissive than for C++ identifiers. In particular, I can use brackets. And I, uh, my convention in the STL visualizers is to use brackets when I'm displaying a fake name, something that doesn't really exist. Whereas if I'm displaying something that really does exist, like the first element of a pair, then I won't put brackets there, because that's actually its name, even if, even if I'm doing a little uh, other stuff in the visualizers. Um, so this is what produces that. Pretty simple, right? Um, well, not so simple. Um, what if my Gaussian integer has zero parts or negative parts? Um, here I've got zero plus zero i. Uh, for things that are completely real, I've got one plus zero i. Yeah, that's ugly. I would like to just see one. For things that are purely imaginary, I've got zero plus two i. Again, ugly. I would like to see two i. Um, it gets worse with negatives. Um, here I've got seven plus negative eight i. That's really ugly. Um, and the reason why is that the visualized machinery, in some sense, is very stupid. It only does string concatenation. So because I said use space plus space and then whatever the imaginary part is, if this is negative, I'll get a negative sign here. Um, I would like to avoid that. So by adding some stuff to our visualizer, uh, we can deal with uh, purely real, purely imaginary, and negative part imaginary numbers. And so we do this with if, else, and uh, else if. Um, so here I've got a more complicated visualizer. Um, now in my slides, I will often crunch my visualizers down simply due to space limitations. If you look at the real autox.dat, most of them are nicely tabified like this. Actually, they're kind of over tabified, but I was simply following the existing conventions. Um, generally, you can get away with any amount of white space except in the type name. Um, but if the parser falls over, uh, then I would suggest imitating the existing white space conventions that are there. It's really quite fragile. Um, but it works well enough if you're chaining if, else, if, and else. So I can do things like switching on uh, the content of my object that's being visualized. So if my B field is zero, then I'm purely real. So I can visualize myself just with my real field uh, $E dot $A. So I get zero and one and negative five. That's great. Or if uh, I have an imaginary part, but my real part is zero, then I'm purely imaginary. So I can uh, tack together my imaginary part and I. Uh, here I again need to use uh, pound paren to glue things together into a list. If I have a single expression, I don't need to bother with that. I can just say dollar dot a. So with this, I can get two i and negative six i. That's great. And I can handle the negatives um, by testing. Okay, if I have a real and imaginary part, and my uh, imaginary part is greater than zero, then I'll use the expression I did before. But if my imaginary part is less than zero, I want a space minus space, and then because I've already put the minus sign there, I will negate. Uh, the B field, and so I'll get uh, 7 minus 8i here. Um, and same with the children, I'm not modifying them at all, so if I popped any of these open, I would get real and imaginary. 
Um, so that's a pretty basic visualizer. This is somewhat uh, what std perplex looks like. It actually doesn't bother to use elif. I'll need to change that in the future for some reason. Uh, perhaps it was implemented uh, before elif was implemented in the underlying machine. Uh, so that's complex. Um, any questions before we go on to the real uh, vector visualizer? Mm -hmm. Yeah. How much of that can be done in Visual Studio 2005? Um, everything here will work in 2005. Um, yep. There is two exceptions. I'll point them out. They're the new features in 2010 that I requested from the debugger team. Um, everything, including that uh, super secret environment variable, should work in 2005. Okay, um, now, there have been bug fixes, so you'll probably notice um, 2008 and 2010 uh, being more stable and more predictable. Um, but this was, uh, all of this will definitely work in 2005, barring visualizer bugs. Uh, okay, so std vector. Now, all the visualizers I'll be showing are directly copied from autox.dat, only uh, reformatted and retabbed uh, to fit the slide. Um, so I'll go over uh, what vector's doing. Um, again, I need to mention this, uh, the true name uh, uh, standard vector, so std vector here. Um, it, of course, it's a template. So I can match templates in visualizers by saying bracket star bracket. This is really kind of a globbing. Um, it'll match any number of template parameters. So even though vector is templated on both its value type and its allocator, this star will match both of them. So this works for vectors of int and std allocator, or double and a custom allocator. It all gets matched because I'm all visualizing them the same way. Um, and then I preview the vector, as we've seen, with its size. Um, so in here, again, I need pound paren as a list of expressions. Um, I put the size in brackets. And here I can put anything that I could type into the watch window. And I know that I can get the size by subtracting the my last and my first pointer. So I can say $E my last minus $E my first. Now, I don't have, you know, Turing complete power here. I can't, like, loop over something and do any sort of computation. I can do anything that I can write in a single line in the watch window. And the, the, uh, the visualized machinery actually handles pretty complicated expressions. Take a look at the uh, std dex visualizer if you want to see something truly horrible. Um, definitely things like subtracted pointers uh, will work. Um, there's a, a few corner cases uh, that I'll get to, um, but uh, as long as you can write it in the watch window, you should be able to write it in the visualizer because it's really the same machine. Um, and then vector special because it's got this flexible array of elements, so I can use um, the syntax pound array. And I need to tell it the size, the number of elements, and I know how to get that. Again, it's my last minus my first. And then what the, what the visualizer will do is count from 0 to size minus 1 and evaluate the expression that I give it here, expert, um, filling in the current index in $i. So this doesn't necessarily need to be a contiguous chunk of elements. Um, take a look at stdeck. Um, it's a series of pages of contiguous elements, but I can get at them as long as I know the index. So I can put any expression here um, that can be computed with an index from 0 to n minus 1. Um, same with the children, uh, I can put the array here, and this is what makes um, uh, that automatically generated list of children with fake names of bracket, zero bracket, and so forth. And I can also inject children with fake names above. So I need pound paren in order to have um, multiple children, and here I've got the size and the capacity. Uh, I mentioned my convention for fake names is put them in brackets. You'll also notice a little bit of redundant information here. I'm displaying the size in the single line preview, and then I'm going and displaying it in the children itself. This is actually something I did in 2010. If you look at 2005 or 2008's visualizers, they display the size in the preview, but they don't display either size or capacity in the children. And that's okay, but what if you really want to know the capacity? So I added the capacity child here, but then I got worried. Um, what if novice users are using uh, the visualizer to understand vector, and they see, ooh, capacity 6. They might get confused and think it's the size. So in order to head off any potential problems, I simply put the size and the capacity here so that no one can get confused, even though this information is technically redundant. Um, other STL containers, all of the containers imitate each other in their visualizers. For things that don't have capacities and they only have a size, then I'll just display the size in the single line preview and not bother at all in the children. This is what we did in 2005 and 2008. And there's no reason to add that extra redundant information here for things like lists. I can also visualize vectors iterators. Um, even though they're accessed by nested type defs of iterator and constant iterator, um, in our implementation, they are actually freestanding classes with ugly names. So I need to talk about their true names, std vector iterator, any template parameters, or constant iterator. If I have multiple types that are all visualized the same way, I don't have to spam out multiple visualizers for them. I can simply or together their names with a pipe. 
And again, sort of simple globbing regex matching, not nearly as powerful as regex. If a type matches either vector iterator or vector constant iterator, this visualizer will be used. And vector iterators are previewed with what they point to. And then in case you really care about the address, or if you want to look at extra fields of what it points to, um, then I add a child with the fake name of Putter. This is a, a nice name compared to the ugly name, and I'll show you the underlying pointer. It's always a good idea um, to have a, a children field, even if you think you're putting all the information in the single line preview, um, because what if the thing that it points to is a struct with extra data members? The single line preview may not show all of that information, but the children you can expand recursively and get all that information. And if someone's not interested in it, they just don't click the plus. So it really never hurts to add children here. So we've already seen um, Vectors Visualizer. Um, here I'm uh, comparing it against a built-in array to show you the conventions that we use in our built-in, uh, in our, the visualizers that come with the Visual Studio um, to show you what we are imitating. Um, if you're trying to visualize something completely new, I suggest imitating either a built-in that resembles it or a standard library object um, that resembles it. So built-in arrays are previewed just with their address. Vector previews are actually better because they show the size and the number of uh, and the actual elements, um, and of course you've got the you know zero one two. This is exactly imitated here. In addition to the size of capacity fields, raw pointers are previewed with their addresses, and you pop it open, you get what they point to. Again, vector iterators are actually more convenient because if you have a pointer, you really want to know what it points to first. So um, the vector iterator is previewed with four five six in this case. But if you really want to know the address or see any um, elements of what it points to, you can see the putter field is the address, and then pop that open. And you could get you know, A element, B element, and so forth. Um, so that's vectors visualizer. Any questions before we move on to more STL data structures? Yeah? Uh, if I want to say uh, vector from int uh, visualized differently from a vector from string. Yes, yeah, so you can match uh, specializations. I, mean, I have a slide about that. Okay. Um, now, by default, visualizers are applied recursively. So if you do have a vector string, as long as you have a visualizer for string, that visualizer will be applied here, here, and here. But maybe you want to do something different entirely for the vector of string, and there you can use <laughs> specialized visualizers. And I have an example. Okay, so string list, uh, just to go over its representation quickly. Um, string list is a doubly linked list, and the thing that uh, users, when they start off using it, um, don't realize is that list actually needs a sentinel node, and this is because List supports bidirectional iterators. If I have a list containing 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7, 8, 9, and I get its end, iter uh, end iterator, I can decrement that. And I need to get the last actual element in the list. That's not possible if I represent end iterators with null, because where do I go when I decrement? So all stood lists have a sentinel node. Um, in this case, uh, the list object itself has a my head that points to the sentinel node that has no element itself, and that's linked in to the rest of the list. Um, in our implementation, it's convenient for us to circularly link everything, um, even though this fact is not displayed uh, to the user. So we need to know the representation of an object before we write a visualizer. Uh, this, the distinguishing feature of std list is that it's linked rather than having contiguous elements or elements accessed by indices. So we need a new visualizer expression for that, and that is, not so surprisingly, pound list. So again, I can preview my std list with its size. Here, it literally has a my size field, so I don't need to bother with any subtraction. Uh, pound list takes several bits of information. It needs to be told how many elements to enumerate, and our list actually knows its size. It needs to be told where to start. Here we take that my head pointer, which is this pointer here, but then we need to step it forward one because that's the first real element. So we want to start with my head uh, arrow next, and that is what we give the head, my head arrow next. And then we also need to tell um, the list expression how to hop to the next element. So here we say the next field. The, this doesn't come with a dollar $E or anything. It's just the name of an identifier. And then this will enumerate all of the list nodes, but we're not interested in the list nodes. We're interested in the values stored in the list node. This object is of type, you know, underscore node. It's a nested of type. We don't care about the next and pre fields. We only want to see the value. So we need to tell the visualizer, only show me the my val um, element of the node. And that's controlled by saying colon and then dollar $E dot my val. In this case here, this dollar $E means the node that we're looking at. Um, now, here's a case where visualizers are not quite as extensible as you would hope. I've seen people try to put more complicated expressions in this next field because they had a, uh, like a way to hop two pointers to the next. Um, that tends to make the visualizer fall over. Unfortunately, um, pound list is really only capable of visualizing things that look like stood list or stood forward list. If you try to do more complicated things in this next field, it 
typically won't work. Maybe we fixed that in 2010, but if so, I'm not aware of it. There's also, I believe, a skip field that allows you to recognize a central node and simply stop on it. Uh, but in this case, we know the list size because we uh, cache it, so we can simply use that. Um, again, we can put the exact same expression in the children. You'll see, you'll see this repetitiveness very often because here you can expand um, the elements of the list. And again, with list iterators, um, it has both modifiable and cons. We preview it with what they point to. A list iterator has a member called underscore putter, but that points to a node. We want the value, so we need to access the myval. And for the children, we want the address displayed as putter because maybe they care about the, uh, the address in memory or they want to see subfields. Um, it's okay to write uh, a value expression here, you know, e putter myval, and then take the address of it. I can write this in the watch window, so I can write it in the visualizer. It's only more complicated things like for loops that I couldn't possibly write in the visualizer. So, uh, yeah, question? So is there, have you figured out the reason for why you don't need the expression operator in the next pair? Um, it's simply the parser. Uh, looks at this and it probably just interprets as a simple field. Um, there were, it next really says uh, for the current node, so I believe that Valerie would be redundant here, but I could easily see it going the other way. I think it was simply a choice that the underlying uh, visualizer author made. I can easily see myself missing that. Like, trying to figure out yes, it's, it's a gotcha. Um, and that's why, um, and it's also not commented, I believe, because um, this is one of the older visualizers that came in 2005. <coughs> um, I went back and added a few comments, um, but I couldn't exhaustively comment everything. So as long as you just put a single field here, uh, you'll be safe. So there's tons of landmines uh, waiting in the visualizers, um, things that don't work as you would expect, and then you have to go hack around and try to figure out what worked. Um, I'm trying to sort of point out the landmines so that you can avoid them. Um, I, imagine my reaction when I joined the Visual C++ team and I was told, congratulations, we're shipping TR1, and by the way, uh, you need to add visualizers for everything, and the syntax is completely undocumented and brittle. Have fun. And by the way, there's no comments in autox.dat. Um, so it took me a while to figure out uh, how all of this worked. I have a link to resources at the end of the presentation um, that are somewhat useful, uh, but um, that and the comments in autox.dat should be helpful. Um, so just to see list, uh, this should be pretty predictable because uh, std list is imitating std vector, so it's previewed with its size and the elements exactly the same as a vector. But because it doesn't have capacity, I don't inject children with fake names here. I simply have the element 0, 1, 2, and its iterator. And just again to horrify you what it would look like without a visualizer, here I'm cracking open the list with a comma bang. I see list is a base class called list val. That has a base class called list node. That has a debugging base class called container base. We don't want to see any of that. And then it has the my head, whose my val actually is gibberish because it's a sentinel node. I need to crack that open and look at its next, next field to get the first element. And it's got two allocators in there. If I didn't know the representation list shown a couple slides back, this would actually be somewhat confusing. I, you know, maybe I'm a new user, and I know that you know, a list begins with you know, elements, and uh, I try to look at the my head, which says it's the head of the list, but its element is gibberish. Whoa, corruption. Let's go file a look. Uh, whereas the visualizer is simply hiding all of this implementation details. I can always get at them if I'm, say, actually maintaining std list, but if I'm simply using std list, 99.9% .9 of the time, I just don't care. I simply want to see it visualized as what I conceptually think of a list as. Um, so that's this. Yeah, question? So one of the reasons that I'll, that I'll use um, comma bang from now is, is <laughs> visualizing like vectors that are two megabytes in size, right? Exactly. Yeah, or something. Yeah, but, where we can't possibly fit all right. the information here. Um, yeah. But do you, is there a way to say uh, terminate the, the list of children at a, at a, at a I believe point? you can. Um, you would have to put a conditional expression in the size field of an array saying if my size is less than some fixed number, right. then <coughs> otherwise uh, you limit it. Fix it yeah, two. say yeah. I'm going to use only you know, 100 or whatever. I yeah. believe that will work because that's a simple enough expression. Okay. Um, hopefully it wouldn't fall over. Um, I also believe that if the number of children is enormous, uh, when you try to pop it open, you'll get a dialogue yeah, get saying, it, right. there's a zillion children here, do you really want to do that? But having it just terminated well, in the visualizer could be more yeah, convenient. Right. Yeah. Uh, okay, so that's the list. Um, next, of course, um, would be map. Deck is, because it is, even though it's not contiguous, um, it's random access, and you, get it, you can get each element with an index. You use pound array. I'm not going to show you its visualizer, because it's really horrible. You don't want to see it unless you're maintaining a deck. Um, but uh, another type of completely different data structure is a std map. Um, again, its implementation is somewhat complicated because it's a, a balanced binary tree, red-black tree, with left, right, and parent pointers. I won't show you the 
uh, representation, uh, but I will show you the visualizer. Um, and because it's a balanced binary tree, the debugger machinery has pound a tree that can traverse this sort of thing. I consider it to be a pretty specialized use unless you actually have a tree that looks like a student app, then it's awesome. Um, again, you need to tell it what node to start at, um, what the sentinel node is to stop, uh, how to get the left, right, and uh, how many elements to enumerate. Um, and in this case, the visualizer doesn't care about the parent field. It never goes up. Um, but we do need the parent field when we're just starting off with the head. And again, we need to give it an expression because we'll be looking at map nodes, but we only care about the underlying value. Um, so this very much looks like a pound list, except uh, modified for a tree. Um, the interesting thing I wanted to show here, and this is a feature new to 2010. Um, I put it in scare quotes because it's really a bug fix I requested from the debugger team, but my wish was granted. Um, that I am injecting a fake child above pound tree here. Um, and it is the maps comparator. Uh, and there's a reason why I'm doing this, and the tree iterators are pretty predictable. Uh, they look exactly like the list iterators. The reason why I'm putting the comparator here is because sometimes this information is necessary. So here I've got a couple examples. Uh, a map from int to string using the default less int, and then another map from int to string using a custom comparator greater int. They store the same elements. Um, in this case, some completely random strings I've plucked out of thin air. Uh, if I look at them in the debugger, uh, I can see the preview uh, shows the elements in sorted order. So I see 1, 2, 3, 4 for the map less, and 4, 3, 2, 1 for the map greater. So that's nice. If I can pop it open, and I can see elements. Notice that fake indices are generated, even though also with list, we don't really think of map elements as having indices, but they're generated anyways, and they start from zero, so we can just ignore them. Um, here I'm also showing the comparators. Uh, this map has a less comparator of type std less int, and this map has a comparator greater of type std greater int. Now, if you look at 2005 and 2008, the type of the comparator <coughs> is actually visible, but it's in the type field of the std map, and it's std map int std basic string care traits blah 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 blah, and then you eventually get to std less. But that's all the way over there. Maybe my type field can't even be expanded big enough on my monitor, um, and even worse, what if my comparator is stateful? What if I have a map templated on a function pointer, and then I constructed the map from a particular function pointer? I can see the type of the function pointer somewhere over here, but I couldn't see what's actually being stored. In 2005 and 2008, this information was simply not accessible. So when I saw this in 2010, um, also we were adding other uh, you know, unordered maps and so forth, I tried to inject fake children here, and I noticed something obnoxious, um, that when I put a child here, these indices were bumped up. They would start at 1, 2, 3, 4, and so forth. That's actually really confusing. Even though we don't think of map elements as having indices, if they start from 1 or 2 or higher, that's confusing. Where would my data go? Um, and alternatively, if we try to put children at the end here, maybe the map has you know 1,000 elements or even 100 elements. It's obnoxious enough to have to scroll down. And worst of, worst of all, not only would you need to scroll, scroll down, but if you didn't know that information was there, you might never even see it. So I really wanted to put the comparator first so that people would always see it, but not bump the indices. So I asked the debugger team, hey, could you stop bumping the indices? I'm pretty sure that's a bug. Um, so they actually fixed that for tree and list. Um, as far as I can tell, array was already working. Um, so now the new feature that we have is you can inject children above pound list and pound tree without worrying about bumping up those indices. Uh, so that is used in map and a couple other data structures that we have. Where, where does yeah. the value come from, from the com comparator? Ah, yes. So my next slide uh, explains that. Actually, I'm doing many things here. Not only, not only am I visualizing pairs, I'm also visualizing pairs, because map elements are std pairs, and also uh, strings, std strings. Um, all of these have interesting things about them. So pair and graders visualizers. Um, what these are doing are hiding base classes and uh, doing something else nice. So std pair in 2010, thanks to scoped allocators, we had to give pair, actually Dinkelmer gave, pair a uh, base class, pair base. We really don't want to see this uh, because it's an implementation detail. So I can give stood pair a visualizer that previews it with parenthesis first comma second, because that's convenient. And then in the children, even though it has children named first and second, if I don't give it a children visualizer, I'll see that base class. So if I give children with names first, e first, and second, e second, this visualizer will replace whatever would ordinarily be shown. So in this way, I can hide the base class pair base that I don't really care about. And I can visualize pair essentially as it used to be visualized 
in 2005 and 2008. In the next version, we hopefully will be able to rip out this base class. It's really obnoxious. I'd love to get rid of it. Um, but the visualizer at least allows us to hide it um, in 2010. And with std greater, it derives from binary function. But I really don't want to see that. Um, so I can hide the children. My technique for doing so, I don't actually know of a more convenient way to do this. Um, I use an array expression, and I tell the size is zero, and the expression is just a literal zero. Um, I notice that when the debugger sees an array of no elements, like an empty vector, it doesn't even put any children, and you don't get a plus here. I can't remember exactly, because this was a couple years that I did this, but I believe if you have children with empty parentheses, the visualizer will either choke, or it will show you the children you would have got any array, defeating the whole purpose. So I use this all over the STL visualizer to turn off children when I don't want to see them. And um, because structs are visualized with uh, brace, dot, dot, brace, if they have no elements, um, this was when I implemented the TR1 bind visualizer. I noticed that being able to preview comparators with their names would be really convenient. So you could see bind greater underscore 1, 1729 or something. Um, so I can preview every STL comparator with just its name. So that's where this greater is coming from. Um, I actually have visualizers for every single STL comparator um, and uh, predicate. Uh, including the ones that were added in C++ OX like bit and, bit or, and bit XOR. Um, so all of those are sitting there in autox.dat. They're all very simple. And std string is the other thing that I was visualizing in that map. Um, string is, it's essentially uh, looks like a vector because it's got the size capacity and it has an array of characters. But the other tricky thing that it's doing, well there's two tricky things here. Um, First is that we have the small string optimization, so we need um, if-else logic to detect when our reserved size is less than a fixed size that activates the small string optimization, in this case 16 cares or 8 WKRTs. We have a union, uh, the string has a BX union that either has a buff field or a pointer field. So if we're small, we're storing the string in our own buffer, underscore buff, but if we're big, we're storing a pointer to a dynamically allocated memory putter, and we'll see this in the children and elsewhere. Um, the other, actually there's several tricky things I'm doing. Um, in the preview, you'll notice this bracket and then comma s bracket. Ordinarily, if I preview a pointer to const care, I would see a single care sitting there, because this is how pointers to ints and so forth are previewed. But if I want to look at a null terminated string, if I say comma s here in square brackets, that tells the debugger, hey, a null terminated string, read all the string until you hit the null, and then display it um, in double quotes. Um, so that's what this is doing here, and I need on both the buff and the pointer. Um, now, in you'll notice I have not only preview in children, but something called string view, which is exactly the same as a preview, except I have SB. This B here means bare. Don't add those double quotes. We'll see why that's important. Um, the, maybe the only really helpful comment autox.dat has is a guide to the possible underscore modifiers, uh, comma, or sorry, uh, comma modifiers, Comma bang is one of them, comma s and sb or others. There's also su and sub for Unicode. Um, those are, there's a big comment at the top of autox.dat um, that gives you a guide to that. Um, and again, string iterators, they also have this string view thing. So what is this string view thing doing? If you look at how a string is visualized, here I've got a small and a large string just to show you that this does handle the small string optimization. So I see the size and capacity. Like an array, it will show each individual character, so I can look at that. Um, and I get the single line preview in double quotes, because I said comma x. But I also get this little thing over here with the magnifying glass and the down arrow. If I click that, I get this thing that says text visualizer. I can actually choose whether to view it as text, XML, or HTML. Um, I always use text, but if you have an XML string, this could be very useful. And what I get here is the string without double quotes, because I asked for bare. Um, and the important thing is that I can wrap it in case the string is really long, and I can, also, I can also copy and paste it. So if I have a string that has maybe a thousand characters that somehow is corrupted or I need it in order to understand the rest of my program, you know, its information will be displayed in the single line preview, but it's being crammed into a single line. I won't be able to see the rest of it all the way over here. And I can see all of its characters, but if I have like a thousand, then I certainly don't want to be copying character by character. That's why this text visualizer is extremely important. Um, now, when you hear XML and HTML, uh, you may think that you can automatically generate some XML and HTML in the visualizer. Unfortunately, no. It really needs to be able to look at something in memory. I believe even a string literal will not be acceptable. It has to be something that's already sitting there. Um, so it's of less use than you might expect. But just the string view is useful. And also, um, string iterators come with the string view as well. 
it would be kind of cute to do that for vectors and stuff as well, to get the copy, the copy and be able to copy and paste the preview for mm. vectors. I would, I would like to see that. You know, I have a vector of int. I want to copy all of those ints, and I can do it individually by you know highlighting this and doing copy paste. Right. But I can't remember if I can copy and paste, paste the whole preview. Right. Um, actually, I think I think you might be able to. I think if you highlight the whole line, I'd have to try it out. Um, you get the whole line highlighted, you can copy and paste, then you have to remove the name field and the type, there's some tabs in there. But I think you can get that. Okay. But over, uh, in, in general, being it for strings at least, being able to access this is nice. The other thing um, is that um, embedded nulls, uh, this will stop at embedded nulls because it's looking for the null terminator. Um, it doesn't take a size. All it takes is comma x. So strings with embedded nulls, they'll be displayed in this list of children here, but not in the string in the text view. It's just a limitation of the underlying machinery. Fortunately, strings with embedded nulls are rather rare. Uh, so that's string. Uh, any other questions before I go on? Is the text visualizer only in 2010? Oh, no. That's in 2005 2008. Okay. Not a new feature. I'll definitely be calling out the new features. Um, OK, so someone had asked about specializations. Uh, reverse iterator, um, this could have been done in 2005 and 2008, but it just wasn't done. It wasn't until 2010 that I noticed that I could do this and added it. Um, Reverse iterator in general, I can actually do a little sketching if you're not familiar with it. Um, Herb Sutter believes that reverse iterators are an abomination. I actually think they're rather clever, um, but it is somewhat confusing. Um, so if I have a vector of a few elements, I have a begin here and I have an end here. So this is begin and this is end. If I get reverse iterators to it, this would be r begin and r end. Conceptually, I start at the last element, and I iterate all the way to the end. So I can uh, give uh, r begin and r end a copy to transform to other algorithms, and it, it'll just use plus plus, but step back the iterate. The problem is that they can't be represented like this because vectors don't have a before the begin position. Um, when you dynamically allocate an array, you can talk about a pointer to one past the end, but you cannot talk about a pointer to one, past, uh, one before the beginning. Um, if you try to, you get undefined behavior, um, potentially static analyzers could complain. So what a uh, reverse iterator actually stores, if I say, if I have a reverse iterator R begin, what it's actually storing is an iterator to the next element. So R begin really stores the end iterator, and R end really stores the begin iterator. And when I want to dereference a reverse iterator, I need to decrement that iterator and then retrieve the value. That's nice, and it's all hidden by a reverse iterator. The problem is that if we're debugging, the internal iterator, which is, goes by the name of current, is actually not what we'll get when we dereference. That's confusing. Now, in general, we have no way to figure out if it's a user-defined iterator. We have no way to figure out what would happen if we decremented. We cannot call operators or functions in visualizers. We can only have expressions that manipulate Fundamental data types like pointers and integers and enums. So if I have a, or if I have a general reverse iterator, I have no choice but to display its internal uh, iterator, which goes by the name of current, and then preview it with whatever that iterator would have been previewed with. Here I say reverse iterator current as a hint, saying this isn't what I really am going to give you when I dereference. It's just what I'm storing. Um, and. However, if I have a reverse iterator for vector or a list or any other STL iterator, I know the representations. I know how to decrement that. Um, and I can do that without having to call operator minus minus. So I can specialize the visualizers to deal with reverse vector iterators and reverse iterators. Uh, for, uh, reverse <laughs> list iterators and so forth. There's a whole bunch of these. Um, so the first thing you'll notice is that this is in the opposite order to how you would specialize classes in C++. Um, as far as I can tell, the debugger <coughs> machinery is doing simple pattern matching and it scans through to auto, the autox.dat file and stops as soon as it sees a visualizer that matches whatever type it's looking for. So if I have a reverse iterator for a vector, I put its visualizer first so it will match here and I put the most general one taking star at the very end to catch everything else. Um, whereas with the C++ class, I put the primary template first and then specialize it below. So that's confusing. Doesn't that mean if you're that that makes the the environment variable for the second the separate the second <coughs> file. Yes, I believe that the less. standard library autox.dat will intercept anything beforehand. So you right. cannot use that to override STL classes. I'm pretty sure they're loaded in that order and not the reverse. I could be wrong. I didn't go that far in experimenting. 
Um, fortunately, you, um, uh, you'll probably be specializing your own types, but that would be a concern if you wanted to do something for a vector of right. your type. Right. Um, so for reverse vector iterators, you can see here I say std reverse iterator, std vector iterator star. I, I'm pretty sure I need this space here. Even though 2008, no, 2005 and above, um, permit uh, nested angle brackets without spaces, that's not how it appears in the PDB. Um, and the debugger is basically doing straight up string matching. So if there's a space in the actual type name as far as the PDB is concerned, then you need it in the visualizer. Um, sometimes this can get very complicated with commas. The debugger has strange ideas about where commas go. Um, I used to just simply fiddling around with them until it matches or imitating what the SQL is doing. This is actually a pretty simple case. It gets worse with things like strict tuple and bind and so forth. Um, so if I have a vector iterator that's been reversed, I can preview it and I can say reverse iterator 2 and I take the reverse iterator, get its current iterator, get its internal pointer, and then I can get the negative one element. And then in the children, I can preview the two pointer, um, again, pointer minus one. But in case you're really interested in what I store, I'll show a child with the real name of current. Um, same with the list iterator, I know how to hop to the previous element. Um, there's no general way to do this, because every iterator is different. Here I need to subtract one, here I need to use prev, but at least I can spam out a bunch of specializations to match all the conceivable reverse iterators. Um, I'm not quite sure if anyone actually appreciates all of the things that I added in 2010. <laughs> I haven't gotten any mails, um, but you know, when I was looking at this, I was like, man, if someone has a reverse vector iterator, they're really going to want to know what it points to if they're debugging a problem. Um, so when I added visualizers, I tried to add everything that I could visualize. Um, I stopped at some of the crazier stuff with, we do with Vine, and I, of course I had to stop whenever I encountered an underlying machinery limitation. Um, but that's why you'll notice that 2010's visualizers, autox.dat, is significantly longer than what was in VC9, SP1, or before. Um, so, again, reverse iterator, visualize, this should hopefully, um, yeah, question? Can you copy that down to 2008 and will it work? Um, yes, it will. Um, uh, no, I mean the whole auto thing. Oh, no. So the problem is that this, this stuff will work because it's not using any features that were in 2010 uh, specifically, but we did change the STL. Um, in particular, I believe okay. we changed the stuff that goes into a vector iterator. I can't remember if we changed the whole type name, or if we changed the details of uh, the template arguments, or if we changed this underscore footer. Um, RSTL underwent an extensive rewrite in 2010. We finally synced back up with Thinkware's master sources. Um, so if the actual objects change, then the visualizers will no longer be applicable. But I can tell you that like the stood greater and stood less visualizers, you can absolutely copy those to 2005 or 2008 RTM, and those will definitely work. Um, I believe in 2008 SP1, which is when we added TR1 um, and bind and so forth, that's when I added visualizers for less and greater, uh, because I noticed that was really convenient for bind. But for RTM, definitely for 2005, um, those visualizers aren't there. Uh, okay, so reverse iterator, this should all be pretty self-explanatory. Um, after you've seen the visualizer syntax for a while, you can see just this preview in children and mentally imagine what you'll see. Um, now, one of the limitations that I don't believe there's a way to overcome is if you have a reverse iterator to a pointer, <coughs> we know how to decrement pointers, but I don't believe there's a way to specifically match reverse iterators to pointers, because you would have to say T star somehow, and that star is also the syntax to match anything. <laughs> Pretty sure that would explode. So it's actually reverse iterators to pointers that use this general visualizer that talk about current as if it were a user-defined type. Unfortunate, but fortunately, reverse iterators to pointers are not quite so common as just saying R begin. So here I have to say current, and if I really want the element that I would get, I would need to say uh, array reverse iterator dot current negative one. But for uh, vectors and lists and other data structures, um, I get a reverse iterator two, and it shows me what will be obtained by dereferencing, even if um, the current points to something else. Uh, okay, so any questions before I move on to a, a couple of hack arounds that are necessary? Yeah? The current is actually a member on ARI? Uh, yes, it is. Okay, yeah, it's, it's not, a real it's not using an alias that you right. use. It's not a fake name. Or anything like that. Yeah, if you notice here, I call it current, but its name actually okay. is current. It's not ugly because it's mandated by the standard. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I've been holding on to this question for a while. Mm -hmm. I wanted to see how you handled the specialization. Mm -hmm. uh, you'll also notice that I used it for basic string uh, because we have separate visualizers for narrow strings of care 
and wide strings of WPRT and unsigned short if you're evil. Um, here, I would need to say SU and SUB for the Unicode. So I simply omitted those, but we have identical visualizers for those. So, so the question is, um, do you see any way of doing a visualizer for something like multi-index? Um, what is problematic in its representation? We have those already. Oh, you do? Yeah. Awesome. Therefore, the answer is yes. The answer is yes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay, so reverse iterators. So now hack arounds. Now, some of the things you simply can never do in visualizers are like for loops and general computation. One thing you can do in visualizers with a little hacking is dealing with template parameters and macros. The problem is that template parameters and macros are constructs that exist at compile time. The visualizer, mm -hmm. even uh, the debugger, even though it can take you to particular lines in your source file, it doesn't really know what happened at compile time. It can only see the information in the PDB, which conveniently maps functions to line numbers and so forth. Template parameters and macros wash out of the compilation. So if you have a data structure with a non-type template parameter, like std array, that has a size parameter that's really important because we need to know its size in order to know how many elements to visualize, or if you have a macro that affects your representation, like our iterator debug level that changes the data members that we have, you actually can't directly match them in the debugger visualizer. If you try to talk about underscore size, it'll actually explode and say, whoa, I don't know what this is. Um, so the workaround um, that is somewhat commented in our sources um, is to provide helper enums in your actual source code. These enums are not used by the rest of the source code. They simply inject the right information into the PDB, and the visualizer is capable of reading enums, whereas it's not capable of reading uh, template parameters and macros. You could also use static const integral data members, um, but I believe that those are actually displayed as members of the object if you use comma bang. That's obnoxious. Enums aren't, so we use enums. Um, we use ugly names. Please don't imitate us. This means something like expression evaluator for native, and of course, underscore capital means it's for the standard library. Um, but we just have this enum for the size, and same with this macro. Um, here, I'm showing that the array const iterator, when our debug level is non-zero, um, in order to do debug checks, we store a pointer to the base of the array um, and an offset so we can detect when you're going past the end. But if you've requested super speed in release mode, which is now the default in 2010, hey, yeah, um, we store just this pointer for maximum speed. The visualizer needs to know this um, because if you are in debug mode, it needs to add IDX to the pointer to get the element that it's pointing to. So as long as I have those enums in the array, I can talk about dollar $E dot and then the enum. And in the array expression, I can also use that enum. And in the iterator visualizer, I can switch on the IDL, uh, iterator debug level enum, and say, if it's zero, then visualize dereferencing the pointer. Otherwise, I can actually do something tricky. Um, because I know the size and I know the index, I can detect end iterators. This is something that vector iterators cannot do, because they're simply storing a single pointer, and they don't have a back pointer in general to the container. Um, whereas, if I do know both pointer and index, I can detect the end iterator and preview with something nice instead of gibberish. I tend to do this whenever possible. Um, and if I'm not the end, then I need to say pointer and then use um, the bracket operator, built-in bracket operator, um, to get the index. Uh, so I'm not even going to bother showing what the ID looks like, because that's all self-explanatory. Uh, any questions before I get to the new feature in 2010? Okay, so. The most complicated thing to visualize um, that we ran into, actually second most complicated, was shared pointer. We added this in 2008 SP1, um, and we added a visualizer for it. Um, but in 2010, we got more machinery from C++ OX, um, and I requested a feature from the bugger team, and my wish was granted. Um, so I'm going to talk about it now. Uh, the thing about shared pointer is it's, conceptually, we just think of it as a owning pointer to an object that's been tagged with a ref count somewhere. But what it really does is it's allocating a reference count control block. So if I have a shared pointer to int that owns 1729, um, it has a field called putter, we saw it briefly before, that directly points to the object. So dereferencing the shared pointer is zero overhead. I don't do a double indirection, I don't do any uh, validation, nothing. I simply hop right to the object. Then I have another field called rep that points to this reference count control block that I've allocated. It's actually a pointer to ref count base in our implementation that stores a uses field, this is the number of strong refs or the shared pointers that collectively own the object, and a weeks field, which is the number of weak pointers that point to the object, plus one for all the shared pointers that still point to the object. 
Um, this is an optimization to avoid having to increment and decrement this thing every time a shared pointer is constructed or destroyed. And then the reference count control block also stores a, another pointer to the object. This one is used for deletion. It's very powerful because it can allow uh, objects to be deleted with the right type, even if they don't have virtual destructors. But for visualizers, it's not interesting because we already have this pointer, so I'll ignore it from now on. So this basic ref count control block is used if you just say shared pointer int sp construct for new int 1729. Um, we also have other control blocks. Um, this is shared pointer's trick of forgetting um, a custom deleter or a custom allocator and not infecting the type of the shared pointer with it, but remembering it later when the object actually has to be destroyed. So if you give shared pointer a custom deleter or in C++ OX a custom allocator, these are stored in separate derived classes that derive from ref count base. So because ref points to ref count base, we can always access the uses and weeks fields, but we also have this detour and my al fields that can be used when we're finally destroying or deallocating uh, the reference count control block. Um, so these are the three ref count control blocks um, that are used by shared pointer itself. If you use make shared, we have more ref count control blocks. If you have make shared or allocate shared, we're able to do a sneaky optimization. This is actually the biggest chunk of code I wrote uh, from scratch in 2010. Um, we have a separate drive type called ref count obj. And the trick is because we're allocating both a object and a shared pointer to the object simultaneously, we can stuff the object in its ref count control block. This saves space. It saves a single dynamic memory allocation. That saves overhead. It saves lock contention on the lock that protects the allocator. It's just good all around. Um, but it needs the separate derived object. We have an aligned storage data member that we go placement new, um, the object in. In this case, it's an int of 1729. And we have another one if you give it a custom allocator to allocate and destroy this block. So all of these derived types are nice. Um, but if we want to display information about them, we run into a limitation. This limitation is in 2005 and 2008 and was finally solved in 2010. So the problem is that here I've got a shared pointer that was constructed using the default method um, and the ordinary method and another one that was constructed with make share. If I pick open the representations, I see this rep is a ref count base star, but they point to different derived classes. The ordinary one points to a ref count and the one that was constructed from make share points to a ref count obj. So the problem is that if in the visualizer I would like to display how a shared pointer was constructed, I need to basically traverse this pointer to base and look at its derived information or at least its type. Um, poss possibly its information if it has a custom deleter or custom allocator. Um, the old visualizers were simply not able to see through this, so I call it a brick wall. Um, now, the debugger actually does know the derived type. You can see here, if you pop open rep, it does show you the derived type. It even shows you the vtable pointer, um, and it shows you the derived members. You can crack it open. Here it's only showing the base members. Um, but the visualizers were not able to see through this. This was sufficiently obnoxious that we got it fixed in 2010. So now you can write visualizers that handle internal pointers to bases. The way that you do that is you provide visualizers um, ahead of your central visualizer um, for all the possible derived types you could be using. So for the ref count, I preview it with default. I maybe could have said ordinary, but I thought default was okay. I'm worried that it, it's confusing with default construction, uh, but at least it says, you know, I'm the default deleter. So that's why I came up with that term. Um, but this ref count doesn't store any, inter any interesting information itself, so it just has no children. Um, ref count del has a custom deleter, and its deleter might be a function pointer. So its state is interesting at runtime, or it could be a function object for the data member. So I give it a child with the fake name of deleter, and that's the detour. Same with the allocator, I have both a deleter and an allocator. Um, if I was constructed with make shared, I would like to really show that in my visualizer, because it could be interesting that, wow, I have a single control block um, instead of two, so I'm efficient. Maybe I want to go hunt down any objects that were constructed without make shared. So I'll preview it with make shared, but I don't store any state. And with ref count object alloc, I'll preview with allocate shared, but I'll show you my allocator in, in case I'm a stateful allocator with a heap pointer or something. So I need to provide visualizers for all of my internal <coughs> derived types, and then in shared pointers visualizer, I can access them. Um, so I'm doing a lot of stuff here, but the important thing is that at the end of the preview, e.rep is that pointer to base. So if I preview it with dereferencing, this is a dereference pointer to base. Previously, that would have looked for a visualizer for its static type. The change in 2010 is that it'll look up the right visualizer based on its dynamic type. 
So if this is a ref count obj alloc, then I will select the visualizer here and I'll inject allocate shared in the preview. Or if it occurs in the children, I'll have a child with the name of allocator. That's what I do here. I'm in the children. I'll show you my deleter and allocator by dereferencing my pointer to base. I'm doing a bunch of other stuff here, um, but it should be pretty self-explanatory. I can use if else to detect if my pointer, my shared pointer is empty. Um, I'll preview it with what I point to. I'll show the strong ref count. I will get pluralization right. So if I have one strong ref, I will say singular. And if I have more, I'll say plural, because I hate parentheses as parentheses. Um, if I have no weak refs, I won't even show anything. Um, but if I do, I'll show them, and again, uh, again I'll handle the pluralization. Um, here I'm subtracting one to conceal that optimization again. Um, so this uh, allows us, here I've got a bunch of different shared pointers, an empty one previewed with empty, one constructed through the ordinary method that says default, and also shows the strong ref count and so forth. Um, one that was constructed with a custom deleter. Here I'm allocating an int and then using free, the pointer to function, to get rid of it. So if I preview this, I'll see it has a custom deleter. I can crack it open and see, ooh, custom deleter and it's free. This is information that was inaccessible in 2005 and 2008, if you were using who shared pointer, um, because you would have to see through that pointer to base. And saying if I have a make share, I can see that it was constructed with make share. Um, and I can also see the number of weak refs that I have and so forth. Um, now, you'll notice that there's a limitation here. Even after we're able to see through the brick wall, we can't quite do everything. The thing is that in shared pointers visualizer, we don't know what derived object we're internally storing. So here, I have no choice but to say my deleter and allocator, even if I don't have one, or if I have only a deleter. Uh, because I can't switch here on whether this is a ref count obj or ref count del or so forth. Mm -hmm. I can simply say preview or visualize this guy and select the right derived type, but in shared pointer's own visualizer, I can't do any if else elif. That's a limitation, uh, but it's not really that onerous. Um, and same up here. Uh, okay, so any questions? Okay, so, oh, did you have a question, Stephen? No? Okay, so. Shared pointer, um, being able to see through uh, this pointer to base is really nice. There's an even worse or better case um, for this, and that is std function, whose whole purpose in life is for type forgetting. If I have a function, it's templated on its signature. Here, a function taking in returning bool, but it forgets the actual type of the function or function object that it's storing. I can construct it from a function pointer, from a struct, from a lambda, from a lambda with a capture, all that derived, uh, all that actual information of the function object type is stored somewhere, but it doesn't infect the actual std function's type. This is accomplished through either a virtual function or the moral equivalent thereof. Here we have, if you crack it open, it's really horrible, a pointer to impl base. If we were constructed from a function pointer, it points to an impl no alloc one templated on callable fun that eventually has this pointer to function we're interested in. Um, whereas if we're storing a struct by the name of prime, we point to an impl no alloc one of callable obj, which stores this internal object. Because it's pointer based, we can't see through it. So if you look at 2008 SP1's visualizers, um, where we added std tr1 function, um, its visualizers display something very simple. If the function object is default, uh, if the std function, std tr1 function, is default constructed, if it's empty, we'll preview it with empty and no children. If it actually stores something, we preview it with full, and we don't tell you anything else, because we can't see through <laughs> this pointer to base. That was exceedingly unhelpful, and combined with shared pointer, um, that's why I asked the developer team, hey, this is really obnoxious, because stud function is really useful, can you give us a feature? <clears throat> so now, we can see through the brick wall. Um, again, we provide visualizers for all of these internal derived objects. Um, in this case, <laughs> simple no alloc. We can always access this call the object field in this case, even though it's sometimes templated on callable fun and callable obj, we always get the store <coughs> functor by accessing callable object. So I don't need separate visualizers for that. Because we don't have variadic templates, I do need to spam out visualizers for impl no alloc 0, 1, 2, and so forth uh, to handle n number of arguments. Mm -hmm. um, but they're all previewed the same way. And then in tr1 function, if my internal pointer is 0, I'm, e I'm empty, as before, with no children. But if I do have an impl pointer, I can preview myself by dereferencing it. And here I can say functor and allocator. Again, same limitation. Maybe I wasn't constructed with a custom allocator, but at this point, I don't know it. When I get to the derived object, I do. I have separate visualizers for the impuls that store allocators. I haven't shown them here. Um, so function visualized. 
Um, function, stood functions that store function pointers can now be visualized with them, even int, that's great. Um, if I store a struct, um, if the struct is stateless, it's just previewed with brace dot a dot. I can't affect that unless I provide my own visualizer like with std greater. Um, here I haven't done that, so I do see dot a dot. But if I crack it open, I can see that the functor is of type prime. This is a whole lot better than having to pick through its representation, which is exceedingly unhelpful. If I store a lambda, stateless lambdas are like stateless structs that they're previewed with dot a dot. I can see that it is a lambda. Unfortunately, again, another limitation. I get anonymous namespace, lambda zero. So I could look through my translation unit and count the zeroth lambda that I mentioned. <laughs> Unfortunately, there's not currently a better way to deal with this. Um, and then we've got this issue with PC images, but at least it says it's a lambda. That's nice. I was pleasantly surprised. If you store a stateful lambda with a capture, in this case a data member X that's been captured by reference, that's just an ordinary struct as far as the compiler's concerned. So it actually is preview, just like a struct, with the captured uh, reference, you can see it's of type int ref that's currently 1729. So for state full lambdas, this is quite useful. It's only if you want to find the lambda's actual body. Mm -hmm. That could be somewhat inconvenient. But overall, a great advance over what we had uh, in 2005 and 2008. Um, so if you have any more questions, um, you can uh, email me. I'm at sdlmicrosoft.com. Uh, very easy to remember. Um, and if you want more information, uh, funny thing about this is when we initially had this in 2005, <coughs> Uh, undocumented and unsupported, um, a developer uh, by the name of Avery Lee, who maintains an open source application called Virtual Dub for video encoding, uh, went through and figured out, hey, all these STL objects are all convenient now. How is that? And he actually uh, figured out how autox.dat was constructed and all of the machinery inside it. Mm -hmm. um, and he wrote a series of blog posts that explained how to use these visualizers. This was so useful that when I took ma uh, maintainership of the visualizers, I refer extensively to these blog posts in order to figure out how they worked, because there were no other resources. Um, when I told Avery Lee this, he was somewhat amused that a Microsofty had to read his blog po post <laughs> in order to figure out Microsoft technology. Uh, very recently, uh, just a couple weeks ago, he posted something about another gotcha. Uh, so I put links all here, but you can just um, search, Google them, Bing them, whatever. Um, virtual dub, visualizer, that'll bring up the post. Yeah, that. uh, any questions? About visualizers, visual C++ libraries, a compiler. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm working with uh, for, uh, uh, for uh, binary data a lot. Mm -hmm. And I don't see any binary visualizers in the debugger. Um, what do you mean by binary visualizers? Well, a hex uh, display all the data. You can customize a visualized display integers and hex. Um, that's, I believe it's like comma x. Um, just like comma, s, and so forth. Yeah. Um, look at the big comment at the top, autox.dat. That's useful if you want to force something to be displayed as hex, yeah. or vice versa, if you want to force something as decimal, yeah. even if the user has right-clicked on the watch window and said, show everything as hex. Sometimes you really want decimal. I'm aware of that. But uh, a lot of displayed in box like uh, text strings. Uh, uh, OK. Um, well, that's OK. Mm -hmm. uh, you had a question first? Uh, have you ever thought about doing something like the Visual C Sharp guys, with a, where you can actually put dialog boxes in to visualize? Yeah, and I've, I've seen they can apparently preview bitmaps and everything. Their machine is exceedingly powerful. Um, I've talked to the, bugger, to the debugger team, and in the next release, they are planning, nothing set in stone, um, to make this officially supported, which would be nice, and potentially making it more extensible and more powerful. Um, it might take a while before we get all the power that the managed visualizers have. Um, but my, my, one of my hopes um, with this presentation is that by getting Boost to provide their own visualizers for types, if we get enough people using this, someone will pay attention and say, wow, a bunch of people are depending on this, and we've got all this stuff for C-sharp. Let's make the native visualizers as powerful. Um, but currently, we don't have uh, any such technology in this particular visualizers. There's something called um, expression add-ons or debugger add-ons that are actual DLLs that you write that can do something more powerful. I've never used them myself, but I believe those are actually documented in MSDF. Um, it's only this uh, you know, text file that's not documented. Uh, did you have a question? Over here? Oh, OK. Anything else? No one asking me what new features we're in yet, which I can't ever really answer, <laughs> except to say that I really want variadic templates. <laughs> <laughs> Any complaints? Visual Studio. Everyone's happy. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> Quit using it. Yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> uh, question. Okay. Yeah, this is about new features. Okay. Does Visual Studio 2010 have support for code refactoring? 
Um, in the IDE, I'm not the best person to ask about that. Um, have you seen Mark Roberts? He's I'm, actually hiding back here. there. Well, what was the question about will we support the factory? factory? Yeah. Um, so obviously we, we can't comment on whether or not we, we definitely will, um, but we, uh, we, we're, we're planning on, we're, we're, right now we're actually in the planning process for what refactorings we'd like to support if we do. Um, so if you, want to, if you have any questions or comments about that, you can come talk to me offline. In 2010, the major thing that we did is we ripped out our IntelliSense engine and replaced it with an EDG front end. Um, so that took a ton of work. Um, but now that framework's there for more detailed code analysis that the previous uh, machinery, uh, a mutant build of our real compiler front end, was completely unable to do. And I believe that's the stuff that would power refactoring, although I'm not an expert on it. Yeah? Okay, so yeah, that actually I do have a question then. Mm -hmm. um, the, the debugging information that's put out by the uh, 2008 compilers, mm -hmm. um, is that compatible with the 2010 debugger? Um, I believe so. Yes, um, it is. Yes. It is. It is. So it's that, a well-known PDB format. So that if I'm compiling with a 9.0 compiler, mm -hmm. then I can use all of these features. You can debug using with the 2010, yeah. including the new Telus and Telesum. Yeah, okay, absolutely. You and we, we now officially support, I believe, multi-targeting. We do. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you can actually take the, the new IDE, and even if you're using the old compiler, um, you can migrate to the new IDE and still use the old tool set. To, if, you know, we used to always require that if you use a new IDE, now you have to use the Visual Studio 2010 compiler as well. But you can use the Visual Studio 2010 IDE with the 2008 compiler um, in this release. Oh, the rule, though, is that the compiler and the libraries have to match, right? Right. I don't believe we yet support any mixing there, and I would be opposed to that as a library dev. Right. So I don't yeah. know how yeah. You'd be surprised. When people love mixing everything, they want to mix versions, they want to mix compilers, it gets to be somewhat of a headache. So, yeah. Uh, you mentioned um, that there was a way in the visualizers of um, also showing raw, raw members. Yes. Um, you can add a child, um, and this is actually covered in a release post, but you simply add a child um, whose uh, expression is dollar $E, comma bank. And you can give it a name like raw data members. We actually do that in a couple places. Um, in std function, we used to do that. Now we don't because we can show everything. Yeah. But it's always a good escape hatch. That makes sense. Yeah. Simply say, show myself without any interpretation. Uh, yeah. One more question. You mentioned the std deck visualizer. Yes. Which is a crawling board. <laughs> I'm really curious to see it. Uh, just look at autoex.dev. I could actually bring it up if you really want to see it on my laptop. I've got Visual Studio. It, it's a nightmare because uh, we need to do a bunch of math in order to figure out what block we're in. Um, and then deck is this other thing where if you're constantly pushing elements on one end and popping from the other, instead of constantly allocating more and more blocks and freeing others, we're circular and we simply wrap around. And doing the module arithmetic for that complicates the visualizers. And then DEX iterators are horrible. And also, reverse DEX iterators are the most horrible. Um, oh. But it all mostly works except when it breaks. So, <laughs> yeah. um, definitely feel free, if you're writing boost visualizers, um, to copy and paste one I've already got and start tweaking it. Um, I don't believe we, we, we would be opposed to you using um, our IDE to build things for our platform, um, even though it's our autoask.dat. So feel free. Um, yeah, uh, many boost types are, of course, incorporated into the standard, and now we have standard visualizers for them. So it could be just a matter of changing um, the data member names, especially for things like shared pointer. Okay, looks like no other questions. Uh, thanks for coming. <laughs>